item to design review board to order. I'm Mark Lusing, board chair. I would like to confirm that all members and applicants expected on the agenda are present and can hear me. So members, when I call your name, please respond. Robert Dermody. Here. Nelson Hammer. Here. Chad Riley. Here. Deborah Robinson. Here. Steve Tanner. Here. Uh, and applicants on the agenda, please respond with your name when I call out your project. Uh, the Needham Revitalization Trust for wall murals at 1450 Highland and 1013 Great Plain Ave. All good. There he is. Uh, signage for Levo, Levo Labs, 292 Reservoir. Tim Parker. Hi, Tim. And site plan review, 400 Hunnewell Street. George Genta. Jim McDonald. John Grenier here as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, so good evening, welcome to this open meeting of the Needham Design Review Board, which is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of COVID-19 virus. We have been directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings, and as such, the Governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the movie. Meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. DRB meetings do not typically require allowing public comment. This meeting has been posted on the town's website and supporting materials have been provided to members of this board and are available to the public. They're encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are particip participating by video conference or phone. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to share your screen, share screen your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking, and please speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate, accurate minutes, not like I'm doing. Uh, I wanna review the remote meeting procedures for tonight's meeting. I will introduce each applicant on the agenda after they conclude their remarks. The chair will take comments or questions from design review board members. After discussion, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. The building department requires electronic submission of all building permit applications. Are you saying a copy of the application that should be stamped and noted for the type of approval that it receives will be emailed to the applicant by DRB support staff that can then be attached to your building permit application. Um, I also want to note that uh, attending our town staff, Rana Monadorfer and Elisa Lichman. So I will move to the first item on the agenda. So we have uh, Paul Good, the Revitalization Trust Fund, two addresses, the first 1471 Highland Ave, and the second is, uh, second is the same address. It's the 1013 Great Plain Ave, thank you. So Paul, go ahead. Well, first, um, it's great to see you all again. <laughs> it's been a while since we've uh, had a project to, to bring to you. Um, and of course, you know, why not do it under the circumstances where we actually can't, you know, get together <laughs> as, as we normally did. But uh, <clears throat> the first project was something that actually came out of, of um, uh, two real strong desires. One is, was that we had a, um, we have a parking lot uh, that is at uh, just basically the, uh, next to Walgreens that really has no green space in it at all. Uh, it's, it's just, a, it's a lot of asphalt. And we thought, you know, maybe there's something we can do here that would really, you know, create uh, some, some green space. Um, and in a way that maybe we could, you know, have a, a larger um, message to, to the, uh, to the project. Because one of the things we recognized was that, you know, 
when it comes to green space, that Needham has a lot of beautiful green space. One of those places is Ridge Hill. But, uh, you know, the reality is that not many people from Needham spend a lot of time at Ridge Hill because they don't really think about it. I mean, we have 300 acres of, of uh, you know, places we can walk and, and have trails and, and uh, really do a lot of wonderful uh, outdoor things. But, uh, but people in general just forget about it because it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. So we thought in this project, wouldn't it be amazing if we could bring a, uh, take a photograph of Ridge Hill and then turn it into a wall mural that could accomplish the two things. One was to create a green space in a space where there isn't any. Um, and the second was to uh, create an awareness of Ridge Hill so that more people would remember that it's there, get a sense of the trails and the, uh, and the wildlife that, that's there and go out and take advantage of it more often. So that's how the project basically came in, into being. The uh, technology to do it, um, first of all, uh, you know, we've done, you know, some rap type projects, <laughs> not in the music, but of course in the, uh, <laughs> in the physical dimension. Um, and uh, one of the things that we've uh, had done a lot of research on was, you know, what if we could do a wall mural that in the future, if it needed to be removed, that it wouldn't damage the surface of any of the, of any of the places where it was. As opposed, opposed to the more conventional way, which is basically that, you know, you paint onto the wall and then you have, you know, whatever the future um, issues are with uh, peeling or uh, other types of things that also tend to rely heavily on the artists themselves um, to be available to fix anything that was, you know, that was damaged or, or just aged. So the uh, uh, 3M is, has uh, created materials that are specifically designed to be able to do this type of thing, um, even to the point where they have, uh, it's a stretchable material that actually uh, conforms to the, uh, uh, to the grooves and, and um, indentations in a uh, uh, cement block wall, uh, which this is. Uh, so we looked into those materials and, uh, and found that they had a, a, a great product, uh, several great products that are integrated into this that would uh, allow us to do this. And thanks to uh, a wonderful gentleman named Seymour Levy, um, who went out in the spring about, I think, six times to be able to photograph uh, Ridge Hill <laughs> as it was basically, you know, blooming. And he found uh, one of the shots that was, we felt was like the perfect combination where you have the, the arching of the branching of the tree coming in from the side. Um, and then the look sort of down, the, down where it crosses the road uh, with the trees on either side. And you can literally stand in that spot um, at that part of the season and, and be able to get that same view. But there was one more piece to it. We wanted to make sure that when we were integrating these things that, that uh, we wanted to be able to have people connect to the trails and to the wildlife that's there. And so uh, the photographs that you actually see in the side of that, uh, in those bubbles around the right-hand side the circles, uh, are actually real photographs of uh, actual animals who were at uh, Ridge Hill at the time they were photographed uh, or directly around that area. And so if we've got a, uh, you know, opportunity to be able to show off the, the wildlife, the trails, and the green space all in one spot. And as an additional piece in the lower right-hand corner, uh, it's probably a little hard to see, but there's actually a QR code down there. And uh, the plan for the QR code is to be able to have a uh, video made that will tell you about Ridge Hill that you can basically trigger with your phone and, uh, and be able to, to, to learn more about the, about the place by just standing there. The other thing that was an advantage in terms of the sighting was the fact that 
there is a, um, uh, the spaces all in front of this are handicapped uh, spaces. And there's a, uh, basically the, the concrete curbs that are the stop for those spaces there. And then there's this distance <clears throat> from behind them to the wall that basically is just empty space that, that people actually don't even walk down behind. So that gave a, uh, you know, sort of a setback uh, for, from the wall, um, which was, you know, an advantage in terms of uh, just physical contact with it. And uh, the other technology is that uh, by using the, the, there's two different materials that go into this um, project. One is the wall material. Then there's when you go to the window areas so that we can have a fully integrated image. Um, we use this uh, uh, additional material. You can see it's specced in the, in the sheet there. But it, <clears throat> but it basically what it does is it um, allows it to be able to conform to the window frames itself and onto the windows. It has the same warranty um, and, uh, uh, and life expectancy as the wall materials itself, it's probably thicker. But what, 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 um, uh, but what it, it can do, it allows it to do is be able to actually have uh, a, um, a cutting lathe cut small eighth inch slots in the material so that light still passes into the hallway that this backs up to and you can see out, but when you stand back from the image, it stays as a as a as a quite integrated, um, you know, image. The other couple of items that you can see in there, one is that that uh, on the upper right hand corner <clears throat> of the wall itself, there's a vent pipe, um, and the wall mural would just confirm a conform around that that vent uh, vent pipe. And then the vent pipe itself would just be on the exterior of it, just uh, wrapped to match the color of the wall. And uh, there's a wire that's also back there, but it basically just comes out through that same uh, opening that was drilled in the wall for the vent pipe. And it just runs up. So the material just runs behind it and it actually doesn't uh, uh, have in con any contact other than when it penetrates the material um, to, uh, uh, in terms of the, the wire itself. Across the bottom, one of the things we spec is a, uh, a tile uh, bullnose because we wanted to be able to make sure that the vinyl was out of the, um, basically the ground level so that water and dirt and so on is not constantly running past the bottom edge of the, of the mural itself, obviously to you know, preserve it and to keep it from being damaged. So, we propose to be able to have uh, basically a height that matches. If you can, if you look at the diagram, you can see on the left-hand side of the area that we're talking about, where the Brookline Savings um, Wall is, that there's about a 12-inch uh, band <clears throat> right there. And so we were going to uh, match with this uh, ceramic bullnose tile, um, the um, <clears throat> as close as we can to the color of that and run it straight across the bottom, basically connecting the band to the other side of the wall. The other option that, uh, um, you know, that we're obviously welcome, welcome your input on is we could also do it with a tile that was closer, more closely colored to the darker shade that is on the interior um, to be able to keep with the continuity of that. Uh, either one would probably be, a, you know, a good option, but, um, you know, Obviously, I'd love your input on what you think from a design standpoint, um, either one of those would be. But this allows the bullnose top to be the stopping point for the uh, vinyl and uh, uh, or the, the material. Actually, the material is proposed is actually not a vinyl, but they didn't specify the, what it is. It's a special thing that, that uh, 3M has cre created for this. Uh, it's also more environmentally friendly. So. Um, but that material basically would come down, stop at that bullnose, and then go up to the top. It would slip just underneath the, um, uh, the flashing at the top of the building, and then just come down both sides right inside the, the uh, area that's delineated by the change in the paint color on the wall uh, itself. Any questions so far or things I... 
should try to cover. <laughs> Why don't we start with some of the board members' questions? And because uh, I think there are some other issues I could bring up, but I think we'll just let them come out as we review this. So, Chad, do you want to start? Uh, sure. I think overall it's a nice composition. Um, I think getting the, the map and, and some of the graphic elements helps. Uh, I guess the, there's a couple of um, sort of pragmatic questions I had. One is you were talking about some different ways of terminating the bottom, and I would think just with snow and plowing, something that kind of protects the bottom edge is, is not a bad idea. Um, and the, there's a picture that shows a number of um, uh, handicapped parking signs on, on metal poles. And I guess one of the questions is, um, are those all gonna stay and be in front of the image? And then the other um, question that I think you addressed is, I wasn't, I, I, I know that 3M materials can wrap buses and all kinds of things, but I didn't know that they had one that could, uh, was specifically meant for block. And it sounds like from what you were saying that the, the product is specifically uh, made to be able to adhere to a, a block wall. So I guess it, if that's the right product, then that would be a, non, a less of an issue. Sure. Uh, to, to answer your question about the, um, about the handicap signs, actually one of the things that uh, when I first started working on the project, which is a couple of years ago, <laughs> that, um, uh, that I um, had a conversation with, uh, with town engineering just to, say, you know, are there any options in terms of being able to do this if we had some kind of mural? Um, and they said that there could be some options of being able to have that, those signs, you know, be where they're supposed to be, but not have to necessarily be up on the poles. Now, I haven't re revisited that with, um, with Tony um, recently, because uh, I know laws change and, you know, that's uh, it's kind of a fluid thing. So uh, that would be absolutely one of the things that we're looking to do one of the concepts we had was that they could use the existing, um, uh, cut down the existing poles, but leave them where they are, and then potentially run a chain between the poles and attach the sign itself to the chain, which also stands back behind these, um, you know, parking stops. So, <clears throat> based on the distance and so on, they could look at it and, and just make sure that whatever the tension of the chain is, that the, that the, the sign itself could not you know, move farther forward, even with heavy wind um, beyond those concrete uh, footings at the, at the bottom. But that was, that was one of the um, uh, other optional uh, thoughts we had in terms of getting ready to address that, because obviously the sign is due. Okay, Steve? Well, I agree with Chad. I really like the composition of the layout, but these uh, handicap signs, they are regulated by code. They need to be like six feet above the ground. And I think that they should just live with them. Um, putting a chain is gonna create its own problems. Uh, you get kids going through there. They can be fooling around with that chain. I wouldn't like to see a chain there. Uh, <coughs> I think you should stick with the code and just have the signs and make them you know, it looks like you have two signs, one under the other. Maybe you only need one that says handicap parking. And it could be like a blue with white letters instead of white with blue letters. Uh, and it would still meet code and the blue would kind of blend in and they would uh, live with, uh, just live with it. Yeah, one of the questions I, I didn't know also is that there are actually four signs that uh, that are in front of that center section of the wall. And I didn't know, it, there must be some specification for it, but I didn't know whether it was necessary to have all four, um, even because all the sign, all the um, parking spaces, of course, are all marked on the pavement itself. Um, but that was another question we had is, do you need all four or could you use one at either end and then, um, you know, or one in the middle and some, you know, just some other combination of it that might make it uh, uh, less, less of them in the in the viewpoint. But obviously, you know, even if it, even if they have to stay, that uh, your idea of, of being able to reverse the colors uh, could make it blend into the wall much better. And that's a very interesting idea. I mean, I don't mind going a little gray with the laws and have one at each end. Uh, if the park, if the ground was marked 
right? I don't think anyone's going to object to that. Well, that's that. That's I think that that might be a really uh, you know a, a great alternative because it's really the two center ones that are the ones that you know block the primary view. I do think going back and looking at what the accessibility state and uh, federal ADA say about signage and parking is, is a starting point, though. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, we we'll do whatever we can to. We have to be. It has to be right. <laughs> Several of those signs are identifiers for the business. They're reserved for patient parking. They're not a required sign. They're a choice. So you can talk with the landlord and the tenant and decide which ones they really need. And the only ones that are required are the handicap signs. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, May I say one thing? Sure. Um, the ten tenant signs, they may be able to put on this, just put reserved and the tenant's name on that green uh, concrete um, uh, part that uh, blocks, the, blocks the, from hitting the wall. And it'll be very low and out of the way. Okay. They could put the tenant's name there. Okay, Nelson, any questions, comments? Uh, yeah, the um, the curb stops that are there now are parallel to the wall, even though the parking spaces are diagonal. If the curb stops were to be turned so that they're perpendicular to the parking spaces, they'd be a little bit farther away from the wall, give a little bit more room for the the vertical. Uh, no parking signs, the handicapped parking signs, which I agree with Steve is something that uh, you really can't lose. In the event of uh, inclement weather, uh, mostly snow, but even sometimes with heavy rain, you can't see the uh, handicapped signs that are on the ground. So it really becomes necessary rather than just uh, helpful to have the vertical signs. The other, the other question I have is, um, how fast does this vinyl stick to the uh, block? And the reason I'm asking is that um, uh, I guess, would it be possible for vandals to peel it if they were to cut it? Um, I'm, I'm concerned about what it might look like a year after it's installed. Well, um, the bonding that it does is, uh, is very strong. I mean, if someone comes up with it to physically cut it, uh, that's, you know, Almost anything that we, we have that come up with, you know, with the intention of being able to physically damage it, that's just a risk. Um, I can say that, that uh, first of all, the, um, the color fastness and, and so on of the material itself <clears throat> is guaranteed between three and five years. In fact, um, depending on the application, when, uh, that 3M is, is uh, uh, often um, willing to be able to go five years on their warranty uh, to be able, if the application is using the exact combination of things they recommend for that specific application. So uh, that's something that's, that's negotiated with them when, it, when you actually buy the materials from them. Um, but uh, uh, but, this, but the reason I mentioned this is because if something were to happen to the panel, you know, within the first, certainly within the first three years, that the amount of fading um, or, or, you know, deterioration that might happen just, you know, that always happens subtly when anything is out in the, uh, you know, in the public, uh, in the atmosphere, um, it should be uh, very minor. Meaning that if, you know, if the panel had to be replaced, these are basically applied by um, uh, overlapping the seam. And uh, so individual panel, an individual panel, which would run from the top to the bottom uh, could be replaced if it had to be. Okay, Steve? Uh, can you, can they put a UV film on top of that 3M material? Like a lot of vinyls, they do that. And that inhibits the UV light from fading and increases the length, life of the, of the panel. Yes, actually um, one of the, uh, the um, film that the last piece of the film that they put on uh, is exactly that. It's so this does have a UV film on it? Yes, what, what happens is they <clears throat> they do the imaging, then they have a, a uh, then after they do the imaging that the, that 
the company that does the imaging then applies the uh, ceiling film on top of the image so that uh, which has uv inhibitors in it and, and significantly helps cut down the uh, you know the sunlight deterioration steve uh, paul would the block wall require pre-treatment to help bond the uh, the vinyl to the block um well one of the things we're really fortunate on this um is the fact that that uh, the landlord has you know just recently repainted the whole wall and the building <laughs> So basically what they need is just a clean, um, you know, sealed surface to be able to work with. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than probably just pressure washing it to get it clean, um, you know, a day or two before the installation, that uh, the wall surface is, is uh, a perfect surface to be able to put this on. It's a great idea, Paul. I, I hope you can pull it off. <laughs> well, it, you know, um, you know, once uh, you know, once it's approved that that uh, you know, we we uh, basically just we put it out for funding, and mm -hmm. you know, it's a it's a cooperative effort, and uh, you know, we've got a lot of good people who are really excited about it, and I'm happy to you know I'm ready to shoot another video to talk all about it and <laughs> see if we can rally people uh, along the lines that we've done for so many other projects. So. Okay, uh, let me say, Bob, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, uh, quickly. Thanks, Paul, for the presentation. Two quick ones. One, is there a, a life expectancy for the project? And two, could you describe a little bit how the film works over the, the mullions on the windows? Because I would think the glass and the mullions are not on the same plane. And is it literally, is the film going to take care of the all sides of the mullions? You know, top, bottom, front, sides, all of that. Yes. Um, okay, okay, that's all I need to hear. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it wraps all of the, the entire thing. Um, right. And because of the stretchability of this vinyl, uh, this is not vinyl, I can't call it, that, but, but of the material, that it, um, uh, that it conforms to it and then bonds to it. Okay. But it's, but it's okay. still removable in the future. All right, thanks. Uh, uh, life expectancy? Um, like project? Well, the. Uh, so as I said, the manufacturer will often go to uh, five five years on it, and we're certainly going to be negotiating to try to get that to be the case. Um, and uh, in general, having spoken to a variety of different companies that install these types of materials, that the uh, the life expectancy is usually about uh, double the warranty. <laughs> so. Um, we're hoping that it would be uh, still, because remember, you know, even when it does fade, it tends, tends to fade evenly and gradually. So a lot of the subtlety of the fading doesn't mean that, you know, suddenly the wall mirror doesn't look any good anymore. Um, it just means that it doesn't, it's not as brilliant as it was. Um, so, okay. yeah, so over time, we're, we're hoping that we get at least eight to 10 years out of the, out of the installation. Okay, thank you. I, I think when you, when you're talking with the manufacturer, I mean, maybe they've already been to the site and they've seen it, but it's directly south facing on mm -hmm. masonry, which is going to just absorb heat in the summer. So it's, it's a, from the standpoint of, of um, you know, applying something on, it's, it's going to take about a, as much pounding from the sun as, as you can imagine. So it's good to be clear with that, about that with the manufacturer when you're negotiating it. Yes, and, 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 we, and we certainly will. And if they have any other <clears throat> additional recommendations to be able to, um, you know, to deal with that or, or uh, you know, additional products that they have to do it, obviously, you know, we just want to do it in the most uh, resilient way it possibly can be. Okay, Deborah, do you have any questions? Is she hiding? Okay, she's off for a second. Um, yeah, I just I think you did state clearly, Paul, that it's a it's a series of panels, so that if it does get damaged, you could possibly replace one. And so I think that that was a question I had, and I think that's good that that works. I didn't see it them I couldn't imagine them installing that whole thing and just letting it all roll down. So it's a little bit more like a billboard, I would guess. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. And I think the board, I just want to call up the attention of the board. There is a small sign in the lower right corner, uh, a dedication more or less saying that it's a revitalization trust fund project uh, right above. And then the map above, to, which is intended to point out where Rich Hill is in Needham. So 
Uh, if there were any questions about that, I don't know. But they usually typically do have a marker that tells people who's doing this. And they are a town committee. It's not, this isn't Paul and some other radicals, you know, it's, <laughs> he's appointed by the selectmen and this is a town uh, chartered committee. Uh, do you, I would like to just go ahead and look at these separately at this point, because the other one's a little bit different. Um, so I would, if there's no objection, I would like to vote on this now. So I would take a motion to approve the. One more quick question mark. Sorry about yeah. that uh, sign that says the Needham uh, Trust Fund. I have no problem with it. Just how big would that be, Paul? Um, so I'd have to get the, the sizing for the inches, but I mean, we're you know the idea is <clears throat> it probably be uh, six or eight inches tall, and then. Well, it looks basically it's it's an image that's made to look like a little brass plaque. Okay. okay. <clears throat> and its intention is just to be able to designate that the that that's the revitalization trust fund, and then this and have the sponsor uh, name or names in that area. That's really its only intention is to get those things, in, you know, on the into the mural. How many sponsor names might be included? Well. Um, Let's just say that the only ones that would be no, because uh, I I definitely get that the <clears throat> that uh, only lead sponsors, meaning in general in 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 some projects that will have some two or three um, or maybe top possibly four at the most uh, lead sponsors who have donated a significant amount of money to be able to to uh, do the project. And then all the other sponsors, which would come from, you know, could be $100, $25, any of the kinds of things, um, would all be listed on, we would list them on the website with the lead sponsor to the top, and then all the other donors uh, listed below, <coughs> not on the wall. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, would it make sense to have the map and that plaque a little higher in case there's a car parked in that location? Oh, uh, we could do that. Um, I'll have um, the graphic designer look at that and see you know, how much <laughs> it up a little bit to do that. Okay, that, that's a recommendation. I'm not going to make that a requirement, but it doesn't. Know, that's a good, you know, perspective thing. And and one of the things that we will absolutely, absolutely do too is, um, you know, when we, as we work through the process, is that we will. Everything will be, we've got very accurate site dimensions for all of this. We've got a very high res um, photo, um, but even with that, we're still going to go out and, and as the company that produces it starts to put their graphics together, we'll go out and, and do, you know, test to see exactly where things are showing up. Okay. Any other, anyone else? All right, so I would accept a motion to approve the mural at 1450 Highland Avenue as submitted. I so move. So moved. Second. Okay, uh, we do the vote, which I did not write down this time. Um, so Bob Dermody. Aye. Nelson Hammer. Aye. Chad Riley. Aye. Deborah Robinson. Steve Tanner. Aye. And the chair votes in favor. Thank you. All right, so moving on, the second application from the Revitalization Trust Fund is for 1013 Great Plain Ave. Uh, a small changeable mural on a panel, a blank panel on the what's currently the Needham Center Fine Wines. So Paul, why don't you go ahead and tell us about the thoughts on this one? Sure. Well, this is a <clears throat> this is kind of a, a a uniquely different project because the intention behind this was to be able to have a a uh, an attractive looking display that um, you know still had a decent amount of size for a wall mural, um, but that it would also allow us to be able to change it. And with whatever frequency, you know, that was appropriate. 
And so we started searching around for being able to find any type, uh, types of systems that would allow, uh, allow that to actually um, be possible. You know, we weren't trying to invent the wheel. We, <laughs> we looked out into the, into the world to find if, if somebody had, had come up with, you know, a, a, a product that we could use for this application. Um, and so in just a moment, I'll get to, to talk about how this uh, unique framing system, uh, you know, really can be applied here. But, uh, but the concept of this really started out from the project that we uh, had put together a few years ago called From Needham to the World. And it came out of the, the concept that there are a lot of really cool people that have done things in the world um, that have lived in Needham. And I just sort of discovered this when I was in conversations with uh, Gloria Bryce and you know, the History Museum and, and that. Um, and every time I would talk with her, she goes, oh yeah, well, did you know that uh, this person, you know, <clears throat> who did this amazing thing did this? And do you know that, you know, John Akers from IBM lived here? And do you know that, you know, and, <clears throat> and then you started adding in like, you know, Ali Raisman and Sunny Williams and, and uh, we've got people like, <clears throat> you know, who have done uh, breakthroughs in botany and all, you know, all these different areas. And I know that that almost nobody in Needham really, except Gloria and the people that she talks to, <laughs> um, realizes how much history of innovation and uh, and you know and, and adding a value to the world has really come out of our town. And I think it's something that that can really encourage people to realize that they live in a town where this kind of thing is not unusual, and that they should go out into the world and and you know and create good things. So um, we uh, started to put together a list of uh, uh, a starting list of the number of people uh, and it was starting to really add up. And we said, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could come up with a way of being able to tell the stories? Okay, why don't we move to that, Paul? Because we've got, we've got a bigger agenda tonight. So, so tell us about the physical reality of this panel. Really, we understand that it's changeable. You have a number of candidates, but what, what is this thing and how does it work? So basically the way the, the system works is that a graphic would be created, <clears throat> uh, and you can see an example in your packet, a graphic is created for that, the, th that particular spot. There's a frame, which is called a snap cap frame, which fits into that area. It's, it's then uh, attached to that, that uh, wall. Um, and the frame itself pops open on all four sides. The, you can use vinyl or the equivalent, um, just like you'd print out a banner. It goes into the frame and then the sides all snap down and then, uh, and then it's held in place for, uh, it, for however long that you're going to leave it in that, in that area. You can also use um, rigid material in the same kind of frame, but for our application, because of its size, uh, that you'd have to have more than one rigid panel uh, and we don't want to see them. Um, but, in, but in the uh, vinyl material, you can go to the full distance and be able to snap it in on all four sides. So one of the things that, that the way the frame is constructed is that uh, uh, the uh, maximum distance that we can span is uh, before you, you move past the extrusion length uh, is about eight feet and we're about at 14 in terms of its width. So what they do is they create two seven foot pieces. They butt together with a, with a single joint and the two frames attach. And then those, those sides just lift open just like it does um, you know, for, uh, for all the sides. And uh, to lock it down, um, we've come up with two different uh, uh, design one that was just actually uh, sent to me uh, 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 earlier this evening, which was basically the manufacturers come up with, with a uh, lockdown screws. I had sent them a proposal about some uh, another uh, screw lock method, um, but they've come up with a way of being able to lock the screen, lock the frame so it can't be lifted open. And uh, uh, that looks very straightforward in terms of being able to, you know, unlock it and lock it. And uh, it just keeps people from, you know, thinking about trying to flip the thing open and take it away. 
Okay, uh, let's open up some questions. Uh, Steve, do you want to do you have some questions or comments? Oh, yeah, I do. Um, I, I'm wondering first what the size of this is. Uh, I think the physical dimensions. It's about 14 by seven. Yeah, see where this is located, like right in the center of town, something this big could people driving by could start to look at that. And I would think it'd be a distraction. People on the, on the intersection driving the road. I think we should be more scaled down a little bit, mainly for pedestrians. So I really like this complex uh, concept, but I just think it's a little too big. Uh, and I, I think it could cause problems uh, with traffic, you know, passerbys trying to look at it and read it. And they should be concentrating on driving and let the pedestrians look at this. That's my point. That's my take on this. Okay, uh, Nelson. Well, um, to to counter what Steve is saying, the the uh, the, the uh, video screen on the GBH building overlooking the Mass Pike hasn't caused any accidents yet that I'm aware of, and that that's a lot more visible than than this would be. I I don't know that uh, it would be. It certainly would be a distraction. I don't know if it would cause any problems. I don't have an issue with it. I, th I think it's a great idea. The, the video screen you see from half a mile away. Right, exactly. You don't have to turn your head to read it. Oh, <laughs> I hear you. Okay, Chad. Uh, I, I definitely think it's an intriguing idea. Um, when the fine wines moved in, they had proposed a mural for that location. Um, but they, they, what they presented really, I think, to the board felt a bit more like an advertisement than a mural. And I think we, we'd always left the possibility open that if it was something that was more artistic and mural-like, um, then we'd be open to it. Um, I have one kind of sort of question just about the sort of technical installation and then another one just about sort of graphics and what gets represented. So um, I'll mention the technical one, then I'll mention my other uh, question, and I can listen for the response. Um, Unlike the film, which stretches tight, if we're putting a vinyl or something in there and then snapping it shut, is there going to be sagging or other things where it looks like a temporary banner that just happens to be snapped into a frame? So that's sort of one question. And then I guess sort of somewhere in between what um, Steve and Nelson were saying, um, on the opposite side of this building, there's an actual painted mural that has sort of a big scale to it. And I think the scale is in keeping with the wall, and I find it to be very successful. And it's sort of a, there's, there's a, uh, because it's sort of large in scale, you know, even though it's down an alley, it's not like a distraction where you sort of focus in. And I think in terms of what is presented as sort of a sample um, of what this might look like, uh, to me, it looks sort of small and fussy and a little bit more. I've, I've ran there's a lot to tell about, you know, um, Bob Larson, but uh, to me, it seems like it needs to be a little bit more like a mural in scale and something that's giving sort of a general impression. Um, this, you know, I think it's just this is sort of too busy and fussy. If, if, and so I, I, one question would be an ongoing one about when it's time to replace and put something new. What sort of process is there for um, reviewing the graphics and what gets put up before it gets changed out or before the, the installation? So to me, it's really two different um, approvals technically one is the idea of putting the the panel up there that is a changeable panel and then the other one is a review and approval of a specific sign that might go into that okay sure. you want do you want me to answer those now or do we want to wait for this later yeah go ahead so um according to the to the manufacturer that well when you when they when they actually create this frame they've done very large size uh, images inside this frame. And um, I spoke with the, uh, with the manufacturer of the frame who has been doing, uh, making this frame for quite a long time or versions of the frame. Um, and uh, they feel very confident that there's no sagging, that it, you know, it'll be, it'll look just like a flat, even um, plane. The, um, one of the things that we're going to, uh, one of the things that, that, that's incorporated into this that you can't really see is that when you flip those uh, pieces open, 
there's actually an adhesive band that runs around the perimeter on the inside. And so the vinyl piece is actually sized to uh, fit uh, the inside dimensions of this with uh, when, when, it, when it's applied, it's basically uh, first stuck onto this perimeter rim. So you get the tension pulled into it um, initially. And then from there, when the pieces snap down, they pull it tighter by pulling it against the material on the inside of the frame. So, uh, this, so Paul, who's, who's gonna be installing this repeatedly? So you do one for 10 months and then you do the next one. Who, who installs the second one? Uh, well, uh, Speed, uh, uh, Speed Pro Graphics is the company we'd be right here in Needham would be uh, producing the materials and, uh, and probably going to be the ones who would just swap it out unless it's so easy that we can just pick it up, pop it in ourselves and take it out. Okay, so it's a, a sign company would be doing the changeover so they know how to stretch it taut and get it installed properly. Yes. Rather than sending two of the DPW guys over there to string it up. Well, this, this, uh, it, you know, either- um, if Not it's, the DPW guys aren't good, but yeah. No, oh, no, no. It's just that you know they've got enough responsibilities. <laughs> I need to worry about this. But yes, we we the organization trust fund would make the arrangements to be able to have it swapped out um, anytime there's going to. And our hope is that you know maybe about every six months um, that uh, we would do that because the uh, the cost to swap out once the, the unit is installed, the cost to swap out the vinyl is you know is not uh, not super expensive. So it's it's something that's affordable to be able to be changed more often. Okay. Um, the okay. other question you had was. Um, uh, well, that's fine for now. I was to see if Bob had any questions or comments. Yeah, quick. Um, I, uh, for the full disclosure, Mark, I was a DPW guy in college. Um, the, uh, a little, I agree, it's busy. Um, and I would add into the busyness that we have this image with all of Bob's wonderful works, and then we have gift baskets and gourmet items in the view. So I see some confusion here of Bob Larson's wonderful career and the, uh, the business of selling gourmet goods and gift baskets. Plus, in the view we're shown, we don't see his name because of the awning. And that's unfortunate uh, because this really is about a person and you know, the image below that is not really valid because it doesn't have the awning in it. So that's a concern. I don't know what the uh, building owner might think of that or the, you know, the Needham Center Fine Wines people or yourself on how that might all be resolved. Well, a couple of things. One is, um, you know, we gave, gave the two views because when we did the initial design of the graphics, we did it in consideration of the fact, of, well, with the desire to be able to create a template, that the concentration of the of the information would be in the, in the visible part below the awning, knowing that you could be standing at the town common, looking across the street, and you want to be able to see enough of it so it, it sparks enough curiosity that it looks inter and and still and looks attractive, and then when you walk up on the sidewalk. That then you'd, you'd have the pieces that were revealed in the upper section as the additional information that you get from it. Um, you know, as far as the placement of the name, you know, there's there's no question we can flip that. Um, you know, and as far as the, the concentration of things, um, what, that's the question you asked about about who was going to review the the images. And um, normally, what we do with the uh, with the um, uh, with banners is with that we uh, take them for approval with uh, the select board. But if the process for this, because it's so graphically oriented, um, you know, is to bring it to you guys, then, you know, that's, that's okay with us too. Okay, thanks. Um, Deborah, are you back yet? No, okay. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I guess given the, Commentary. I think that the installation and the concept we're fine with. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be a good thing to fill that panel, and that's a nice. It's a nice tribute to residents. 
uh, from what the members are saying, what I would like to, Paul, is just suggest that we would condition this on getting a final review of each panel as you do them, just so that we can get a sense of things. Um, this is something we look at a lot and uh, we might have, you know, I think there's interest on the board on kind of making sure this does, uh, there's, probably, there's probably always gonna be more information that you wanna put on there that then we're gonna be comfortable to trying to cram in. So I think we, if we, you can work with us on that, I think that would be a nice, yeah. uh, nice, uh, nice way to approach it. We can just look at them with you and figure out some things. And it might might take your graphic designer a revision to get everything right, but it's not, uh, you know, it's worth the time. I think. Yeah. No, that's that's perfect. And I totally get you know the idea of the if you have too much on it, um, same thing applies to banners. Too much on the banner, you can't read it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, you, you work with a lot of great artists. And I mean, my, my sense is maybe if um, you work with somebody and you took two or three different um, people from Needham and tried to create a, a sort of visual style to it. I mean, the, the town is full of shops that are putting way too many like little notices and things in their window trying to advertise what they have. And, you know, it really should look like something of a different quality when, when we're doing these kinds of things that where we're really, you know, honoring and respecting. I mean, it, I'm not suggesting we go the route of the caricature, but I think, you know, there's, you know, one artist who's done a caricature where the, like the center thing is, you know, the, the person's maybe face larger, and then there's some other things kind of surrounding it. But there's, you know, there's, again, not saying we go that route, but the idea is that they always kind of look similar. So when you see that that sort of um, a representation, you kind of know it's a tribute to this individual. And so if there's a way of kind of figuring out um, a graphic language that there's some consistency, even though the person changes, um, then it, it doesn't look like an advertisement that you have to kind of decipher to realize it's actually something quite different. Yeah, I, I agree with it completely. I think that we, we are looking to be able to come up with a, um, with a, a template Yep. It basically creates the framework for it. And then from there, these are inserted into it so that you always know that it's, you, know, you always know what the purpose of it is at a glance. I think that's, okay. that's, think good. Right. that's good, Paul. I think you did say that you're trying to create a template. So I think if we can work with you a little bit and get, get, that, get a ground base of that, uh, then these things will go pretty smoothly as most of the banners typically have when we've yeah. been asked to weigh in on them. Um, any other questions or comments? Uh, I have a comment more as a resident of the town, if I may. Um, love the idea to promote our townspeople. Um, maybe it's an opportunity for us to be more inclusive going forward. And maybe uh, at some of our other public buildings, this would be appropriate, such as schools or library or DPW buildings or something. You know, it's just we have we own lots of buildings in town. And I think the, plenty of them are in public spaces where people could see this uh, celebration. That's all. Okay. That's, I think that's great. And I think that, um, yeah, well, actually one of the things that we, you know, if, you know, we're, you know, doing the first one, but uh, the, um, if it's as successful as we hope it will be, um, I would hope that, you know, other places, you know, around town would uh, take advantage of the, of the, of the, um, you know, ability of this to be uh, relatively uh, low cost in terms of <laughs> in terms of our projects anyway, relatively low cost uh, to be able to actually do the installation. And then of course, the, the most importantly, um, to be able to actually swap out the graphic. It's, it's basically sized as if you were, you know, um, getting a, a, a graphic done for a banner of whatever size the, uh, the frame is made. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so what I, I'm going to do is I would, I think would like to condition this, uh, that we review the, uh, and give final approval to each specific banner as they change as the one condition, um, any other conditions the board would like to add. Okay. So I would take a motion to approve the installation of the changeable vinyl panel frame. Uh, with the condition that the DRB will review each uh, installation before it's fabricated. So moved. Second. All right. I'll, so I'll come to the vote. 
Bob Bob Dermody. Yeah, I approve. Nelson Riley. Nelson Nelson I Riley. Have <laughs> <laughs> me confused there. Nelly, can you <laughs> unmute and vote for us? And he's on mute. Riley's on mute. Uh, I approve. I'm not on mute. No. Uh, approve. Yeah, Riley. Deborah Robinson. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Steve Tanner. Approved. And the chair votes in favor. All right, thank you, Paul. Thank you so much, Paul. everyone. Appreciate it. Appreciate all the great feedback. Wasn't Nelson Riley a comedian? Did I say Nelson Riley? Charles yes. Nelson Riley. Yeah, yeah. Charles Nelson Riley, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Flash in the past. Nelly and Chad in order, and they're, I'm confusing myself. You're the comedian, Mark. Nelson Hollywood Squares. Yeah. Nelson Hammer. That's who I was talking about. That's right. So the record show that was Nelson Hammer, not Nelson Riley, was it? <laughs> yeah. All right. Sorry. Let me just make a note here. Okay, so the next stop, uh, 292 Reservoir Street, uh, assigned for Levo Labs. So, That's me. You still with us, Tim? I am. Tim, you've graduated to being simply Tim on the agenda. No, I'm no, quite pleased no by other, the fact. Thank you very much. No other description needed. It's either good or bad, I don't know. We'll have to decide at the end. We'll decide um, by the end of the meeting. There we go. Excellent. Well, good evening. Uh, so we are looking to, this is a renovated building at the end of Reservoir before you turn the corner and have to make the U-turn back out, faces uh, the highway. It's at the end of the block of two services, uh, two businesses. And we're looking for a standard aluminum bar frame, uh, with black uh, 3D acrylic letters on a white base. The building is cream and gray. It's just been renovated, literally brand new. Um, the garage door is 144 wide. So we're centering our 72 in the space above. And the overall height of the sign band, including the two moldings, top and bottom is 39 inches. And we're looking for 24. OK, that was pretty straightforward. Uh, Nelson, any questions? Uh, I'll pass for a few minutes. Uh, I want to take another look at this. Okay. Uh, Deborah's no facts. Steve? Um, my copy is printed out in black and white. What are the colors here? So the building is black and white? It's just black and white. The building is gray and cream, and our frame is black, white background with black letters. And the color of the area that the sign sits in? It's sort of a really light tan. So it's the, everything you see in the photograph that's light is all the same color, mm -hmm. including the uh, back panels to where the scoop lights are, including the moldings around the windows, everything that you see, if your picture is black and white, everything that you see that looks gray or darker is all also the same color. It's the building is two colors. Okay, uh, Chad, do you have any questions? Uh, it's fine. I mean, I, to me, black lettering on a white sign always just looks a little bit generic. It might look better if it was reversed with a black background and white letters, but if it felt very strongly their about the Their logo happens to be yeah. black. Um, the other option we had was to change the background to match the building color, just so that it looked more, less stark or a shade that's related to the building color. And you decided white because they asked for it or? Uh, it's really their color scheme and it does separate it out from the building itself. And should they move, they can also take the sign with them. And it isn't particularly specific to the color of this particular building for some reason. Okay. Uh, who am I going to Steve? This is not exactly a downtown sign. Mm -hmm. I think the black and white is fine. Okay. Uh, Bob? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at Google Earth, and I'm not sure when the photo was taken, but it appears the day they were rebuilding the building or whatever. Um, so the couple things, the location of the sign appears to be over a garage door. Is that yes. still? 
Because it's at the far end and it, the other end actually is just this small little entrance, that door, and yep. it's off center. And that end actually is exposed a bit more to the highway as you make the turn at the corner at the end of Reservoir. Are they the only occupant of the building? No, there's another tenant at the far left side. Okay. Um, yeah, it's really, f uh, and where will they, people who want to talk to the Levo go in? Basically the garage door, according to them. Okay. Um, next thing in the photo, and again, I'm just going off Google Earth yes. because it's not as visible in what was presented to us. That upper band in which the sign is supposed to reside has some uh, pronounced has verticals. It has some vertical dividers and the center one will be cut out so that the sign sits flush. So you'll see a bit at the top, you'll see a bit at the bottom, and then the sign will sit in the middle. Can they just cut out the whole vertical? Well, then it leave. you mean it would just make the whole sign band one one thing? Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't see why. I can't imagine why not. I don't know what my colleagues think, but I don't know about going to the trouble of having a few inches of that vertical on top of bottom. I think it might also help align the garage door into the building. Okay. That's my thought. Um, and I think that's that's it. Yeah, the, the white and black, I don't, it's, the white, I think, might be too white against the at least the color scheme I'm seeing here, but I'm not opposed to it. It's I will compliment you. It's a clear sign. We have plenty of signs that aren't this clear. Well, thank you. So, I appreciate it. Thank you for that. You can also tone the background down to a lighter gray to yeah. just away the bright whiteness, if that's something that you are concerned about. I am. I just think, um, and it doesn't have to match the color of the building still. It could still have a tone. Yep, but a gray in this case would be beneficial to their logo and their overall aesthetic. So even just a like a ten percent rich black, which would be a very very light gray to tone down the bright whiteness of it all. Yeah, I think that would that would be good. Sure. Okay, we can. Yep, yeah. we're pretty open here. It's a pretty straightforward, like you were saying, Bob. It's pretty straightforward. It's just their name, a frame around it with a back panel. So in this case, it's an easily adjusted thing to make it aesthetically pleasing. And it's not illuminated, correct? It is not. Thank you. No further questions, Mark. Okay, Nelson? I do agree with Bob. I, uh, any other color but white is the background is what I'd like to see. And if it's a, a light gray, I think that would work for me. Okay. The size of the sign looks fine in terms of the band that it's uh, fitting in on the building. I'm okay with it. Okay, yeah, and I, I would agree with the, the rest of the members. The uh, I wouldn't match the building color. I think that you're right. That would be, but a, a light gray would work great and pick up some of the gray as the alternate yep. color on there. And I like the location over the door. I think it's sort of an asymmetric balance going on there, which is a nice, nice feature, I think. So, yep. um, and the material and construction are pretty typical of many of these signs. Uh, any other questions or comments? Well, Bob, Bob mentioned that these vertical elements, which we can't see. Oh, yeah, okay. And if the sign is hollow in the back, can't they just like notch out a spot so it goes well, over the vertical elements? That's what we're, oh, you mean just on the, well, the aluminum bar frame top and bottom would, if we, you can't notch out, you, that's why we were taking out part of that vertical divider panel, that little vertical rise. So that it would still look, so the building would look like it had the same set of panels left to right. And so you'd see it above and below this uh, R sign. Um, and then, but Mark suggested, or some, I apologize if I got the person wrong, suggested that we change the, um, take out the whole thing altogether. Right. Just the vertical. Yes. And that way, that sign band. Or that last two sections would sort of become its own section, With and then the, the other two. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm fine with that. So I would say that we have two conditions: is that uh, rather than cutting out a portion of the vertical band elements, that they be removed top to bottom. Okay. In the sign location. Yep. And that the background color be a light gray. Okay. Uh, any other comments or additions to that? All right, so I take a motion with those I two. I move things. that we uh, approve the sign as amended. 
Thank you, Steve. A second. Okay. Um, Bob Dermody. Approve. Nelson Hammer. <laughs> Approve. Chad Riley. Approve. Uh, Steve Tanner. Approved. And the chair approves as the motion with as with amendments. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks, Tim. If we don't see you before happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. you okay, and the next item is uh, not Reservoir Street, 400 Hunwell Street. This is a major site plan review uh, for the planning boards. So we will uh, ask the applicant to go through. We will have questions and comments. Um, we also always write a memo, if, if I remember, to the planning board after the meeting with telling them that what we talked about and because uh, sometimes we get questions from them about, well, did you ask them about this? So, yes, so we usually will go through the, a little bit of discussion. Uh, although the Zoom has helped on that because it gets recorded and Ron Amanador for writes the meeting notes and most of the, the so the whole thing is done in a little more but um i will turn it over to george and you can take us through the project okay thank you mark uh george shunta jr i think most of you know me um, uh, i'm representing the developer on this project the applicant uh for this project at 400 honeywell and uh, 400 Honeywell right now, it's a two-story office building, about 8,500 square feet. That's been there since the mid-1970s, plus or minus. Uh, the, the new owner is proposing to uh, take down that building in its entirety and to replace it with a new two-story building to, to contain a total of eight residential uh, units with a total square footage of about, uh, I think, 14, uh, just over 1,400, 14,000 square feet in the building. There'll be 16 parking spaces in an underground parking garage with an additional five spaces behind the building, sort of off the ramp going into the garage, and then two spaces uh, along the side near the sort of main public entrance. There are entrances in the, on the, what would be effectively the sides, uh, but would, would function almost as the front and back the units are arranged so that there's four units on each floor and each unit has its own separate um, patio or balcony, depending upon how you want to call it. Um, so I can, um, at the pleasure of the board, I can share screen and sort of, you know, graphically go through things or I can just verbally describe elements. If you want to point it out or and the architect wants to point out, I think go ahead and you can have the screen. Okay. I do find that that sometimes makes it a little bit easier. All right, so I'm just gonna go through the site plan real quick here. So this is the existing building, right? You can see it's basically kind of a, a T-shape or hammerhead type shape. Uh, effectively what we're doing, it's almost the equivalent of filling in these negative spaces here. Uh, and right now you can see this parking along this side of the building and then parking in the back. And there's a shared easement or a shared driveway that comes in. And there's some parking over here that services the small building that's over on the side. And this is what is proposed to replace that building. Again, as you can see, it's basically kind of filling in those two corners. We keep this existing driveway because it's a shared easement, a shared driveway coming in. And then this ramps down to provide access coming down into the back of the building here for the underground parking with the five spaces here. Uh, this would be an area for dumpster uh, back in this corner. And then we've got two spaces up here, including the handicap accessible space right here. Uh, you, can, you can see, you know, this, the red here on the screen shows you the existing building. So you can see we kept pretty much close to the footprint um, you know, on, the, on the side in the main box and added the bulk sort of on the interior of the lot uh, to make it kind of fit better. All right, so with that, let me come out of that. Unless there's any questions on that? What, what's the uh, 
side yard setback and do you get relief because it's an existing building? Yeah, so, so, so this is actually a very odd and unusual situation. This, is, this property is actually in the Hillside Avenue Business District. And in the commercial business districts, there is effectively no side yard setback for the most part. There are some exceptions, um, but they're very limited exceptions. And the primary exceptions being when you, when you have a commercial or non-residential use of the lot, then if you adjoin a residential district, then there's some buffer zones that come into play anywhere from 10 to 25 to 50 feet. But in this particular case, you know, we've got, this is our residential district boundary up here. Uh, and technically here, although this is the train tracks here. So we've got an embankment going up and then the tracks and then going down the other side. Uh, but because our use is residential under the bylaw, that doesn't apply. So we actually don't have any effective side yard setback. The only setback that really applies is the front, the 20 foot front, which we are keeping, which we meet. And in fact, actually our building is pushed back as far as the actual main body, the bulk of the building is a little bit back from where the existing building is now. So our, the porches or, or uh, balconies are at the 20 foot. So as far as the main bulk visually, it's, it's not quite as close to the street. It's set back a few feet. Um, no, thanks. I appreciate that explanation. One thing um, just to be mindful of is I, at least my understanding is that in Needham, the setbacks used to include any projection. So if it's a gutter or a bit of trim or anything else that is hanging off those porches and intrudes into that 20 foot, then um, just be very mindful of that, I would say. Yes, that's, it's changed a bit now, but that certainly was um, an area of some consternation um, in the past, yes. All right. Any more I, I'm a little bit concerned about the uh, steepness of the drive down near the uh, entrance to the garage. Um, uh, I would suggest that uh, if it's possible to pull the curb back towards the building uh, to make the turn a little bit grander, but by doing that, you make it even steeper. Um, uh, does anyone know how steep that slope is going down on the diagonal parallel to the uh, train tracks? Uh, jo John, if you're on, can you, do you wanna address that? John Grenier is our project engineer. Leading the fifth. Uh, one thing I would suggest would be uh, to put a retaining wall uh, where the, the curb is, where those contours are very tight so that you can uh, start the slope down to the garage closer to Honeywell Street than it is now. I don't know if that's possible, but making that less steep, I think would be much safer. Yeah, un unfortunately this from basically here all the way back to here has to be kept flat or relatively flat because it is the shared uh, entryway, shared common driveway. So we can't, we really can't change uh, any of the grades in any meaningful way through here. We can only start changing it, you know, back in here as we actually start getting into the slope. Um, and there is actually, there is a, you know, there's a retaining wall back along here. And then this actually, uh, this will obviously function as a, as a retaining wall coming down around. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this actually when we did our pre uh, our pre review with engineering and planning and whatnot, uh, this was one of the things we looked at, and uh, unfortunately we don't have very much wiggle room uh, to really change much around here to make the basement level work to make it all kind of uh, pull together. Um, but but uh, the the engineers have have you know we've basically done this so that it, so that this this will work as it's designed. But, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is John Grenier. I'm, I'm sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I'm the engineer. And um, actually, George, you covered it fairly well. Um, as George said, yeah, we do have to keep that main driveway flat because that's the parking, that abuts the parking lot for number 430. Uh, that's to the south of us. And uh, that slope, um, it's, I want to say it's, it's in the 8% range. If I, I could be, I could be wrong on that. I don't have a scale on me right now, uh, but it's not excessively steep. Those are one foot contour labels. So um, typically on site plans, most of the time you show two footer. So it, it, just because you see a lot of lines, it may look 
a little steep, but those are one foot contour lines. So it, it's really not an excessive slope. Um, if it's if it's eight percent where the the contour lines are parallel, it's twelve to fifteen percent where you turn the corner towards the garage. Uh, any thought given to heating that portion of the driveway during the winter? Um, going down that slope? Yes. Um, in, in all honesty, we haven't really thought about it. Um, I, I don't know that there would be a need for it. We do have a catch basin at the upper end of that slope. So any, any of the runoff coming from um, both the north and the south will be captured with, with a catch basin. Um, kind of where you see the label, um, the, the um, dimensional label, the north uh, 010 E, there's a catch basin right where that, um, that 80, that 198 contour is. It's a, it looks like a little square. There's a catch basin right there. So we're capturing all the water so that won't be sheet flowing down the slope to the back. And then in the middle of that parking lot in the back, uh, at the center portion about where that spot shot is, that 199.58, uh, there's another catch basin in, in that location. So that captures everything at, at, at the, the lower level. But um, I think the main point is we're, we're capturing, we're not sheet flowing a lot of water down that slope, we're capturing it before it goes down that slope. Okay. Uh, can, can emergency vehicles get down that slope and get back up? Certainly can't turn around. They're not, if you have a, if you have a fire engine, they're not turning around, obviously, they're going to have to back their way out. But if you had uh, something like an ambulance, um, they'd be able to um, turn around and, and go back out the other way. But uh, an apparatus like a fire engine is not going to happen. Yeah, the, the fire department will weigh in, I'm sure, and the DPW, that's, they, they always review these projects. So they'll, yep. they'll have okay. to satisfy them at, at one way or another. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Joe. All right, let me uh, if, I, stop well, this. if I can, Mark, while well, George is picking up a new slide. Um, thanks, George, for the diagram. The diagram that showed the existing footprint and the new footprint was very helpful. Do you have a similar one for the height? Uh, no. Okay, so how what is the height difference between existing and proposed? Um, let's see. I think I want to say, I think it's probably about it's three or four feet maybe. Um, but hold on, and I'm gonna and I'll ask maybe for either uh, Jim McDonald or Kent Duckham uh, to see if they can address that. And let me put the architectural plans up now, so at least you can uh, so you'll see the building. See, yeah, that looks to be about twenty-seven feet high. degrees. So go ahead. Yeah, so so the existing building I think is about 29, 30 feet. And then uh, and then this I think is 32 or 33. But um, so Jim or Kent, if you want to address that. Uh, the, the proposed building is 29 from the uh, finished grid, 29 feet. Okay, the... Uh... Well, that's to the main building, right? The small uh, tower elements, are they a little taller? Or, or those four, 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 about four feet taller. Okay. Uh, what about the elevator tower in the center? In the back, um, maybe eight feet, eight feet above. Okay. All right. So not a dramatic difference in height then. Right. No. Good. Thank you. Right, and and you know this the district allows for a two and a half story, and we're. You know, we're, we're effectively doing um, sort of a, a bulky two, for lack of a better way to put it, but we're keeping the two stories similar to the, the building that's there now, as okay. opposed to doing a, you know, the, there's a, there was a similar project right next door that happened, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, where they did kind of the same idea. They, they put in multiple units, but in that one, they did it in three buildings. And of course, each of the three buildings has, you know, they've got uh, the half story above, so it actually is... We've got much more bulk going up all the way. All right, so so we have um, so we have here. You can see the the basically the front elevation. You know, looking at it from Honeywell Street, 
Um, you've got the, the, the essentially the four units on the front side of the building, each with their own balconies, right? And set of windows across the front. This is the, the steps in the middle of the building, as you can see on the right side elevation here. Uh, so this is the steps that come up to the sort of the main entry door, the handicap ramp that comes up to access that. You can see the, the uh, balconies or patios here, All right? Uh, then we, and we've got the, the rear side where the, where the underground parking access is, the garage entry here. There's a set of steps that come up here that provide uh, access to a walkway that then goes to another walkway to steps to an entry on the, on the other side, which mirrors the entry on the right side. Uh, and then we've got the four units. Basically, it's the same sort of visual. So it's a ba you know, it's balanced, uh, same patios or balconies with the windows. Uh, and then the left side, if you're looking at it from the front on Honeywell Street, and this is that other entrance that I mentioned, the steps from the garage come up over here, walkway comes along and then feeds up into it that way. So it's, uh, it's a mix of uh, three different uh, types of tricks here, exciting. There's a clapboard, a shiplap and channel um, that basically you know, provides some, some different textures, some different uh, visual aspects on the building. Uh, but it's basically a, um, you know, a, a somewhat modern, but also classic design. And uh, if you have questions about that, go ahead and, other and otherwise, when you're done with that, we'll go into the landscape. Okay. Questions, no questions? Okay. Why don't we start with a few review of just sort of the, we've had some initial comments on the grading and the concerns. I think it's gonna be a little bit of a buyer beware of people dealing with that driveway. And if there's trouble, they'll have to figure something out. But again, I'm 8% you know, is steep, but not, not as much as I thought it was when I first looked at it. There's about a six foot drop from the top to that bottom. So George, the retaining walls are gonna be six feet plus, and that may require review. You have to wait and see what the building inspector asks about. Um, is it because there, there was a retaining wall uh, or bylaw put in a few years ago. Right. I actually, actually, Mark, I think I think the, the retaining walls are all four feet or lower. Oh, okay, good. Um, so then uh, I would open it up to the building review. Steve, do you have any questions, comments? No, I'm all set, thank you. Okay, I'll, we'll leave Nelson for the landscaping. Bob? Um. Yeah, and one of the uh, elevation, oh, I guess those are, what are the things on the roof? I'll just say it bluntly. <laughs> oh, sorry, I don't have a delicate way of putting it. I'm just trying to read through the roof plan and the elevation. Are those sort of pediments, if you would, uh, above each of the units? So I'm looking at uh, the, uh, yes. front the elevation pediments. right now. Okay. And what are, are those in the same materials as the siding of the building? Uh, it's well. It's a um, a trim a trim board. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what what uh, are they flat on their tops? Are they pitched at all, or is there any kind of different material on their? Well, there's a, well. It'll be a, a a metal roofing material on top of that, and it's you know it's mostly flat but pitched to to drain off water. Okay. All right. Pitched slightly. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Uh, I think overall the elevations, you know, seem well composed, nice different blend of materials. I would say that, um, it would have been nice just even looking at the plan. There's a lot of, um, with the balconies and things, a lot of things that are stepping in and out. So it would have been really nice to have had you know, like a sketch up model or something that just kind of shows it a little bit more three dimensionally. I think as a lot of people are coming over the hill and driving past it, um, a lot of it, you're going to see kind of a, from a three quarter view, um, because it's not kind of sitting out there by itself. It's really kind of nestled in. Um, I think, I guess the other kind of buyer beware uh, aspect of it is there's a lot of windows that are eight feet away from a property line facing on to some other houses too. So, you know, I think it'll be, you know, 
to they'll have to be an adaptation for the people in the houses uh, that that already exist. And if you're buying it, I guess you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, I guess I would just sort of um, zoning. I, you know, I guess would would allow for it. So there's nothing that that you know wouldn't be there. But I just I guess in terms of you know from a fire separation standpoint, um, I guess I would just recommend double checking. You know, a lot of glass and wood construction eight feet away from a property line. I'm just not sure if, if there needs to be a different kind of flame resistance to it if it's that close to a property line. But from aesthetics, at least from what's presented, it you know, it doesn't have a whole lot of comments. Okay. Um, why don't we move on to the landscaping, George? George, you want to take us through the landscaping? Yeah, let me let me just pull that up here. All right. Okay. All right. So here we go. Uh, so basically, we've got a mixture of uh, of of shrubs and trees uh, all around, all throughout, and uh, one element. Uh, you know, as Chad mentioned about the windows. Uh, you know, one thing we've got is a, a privacy fence proposed for this entire. Uh, property line basically to, to provide some privacy on both sides, um, you know, given the proximity here and the proximity on the other side. Um, so as far as, you know, as far as the landscaping, um, there's a mixture of, um, of, of five, you know, different types of trees throughout. And one, one thing I do want to point out, we've already gotten some initial feedback from both uh, police and engineering uh, that this particular uh, tree right here, this, um, the Armstrong red maple, uh, this one has to come out. They, this is, it's too, they have concerns about visibility, both with respect to the driveway and then also, um, you know, with respect to the, the street. So this one, uh, we've already got, already, already essentially been told this one has to come out. So, so you see the red X I've put on that one. Uh, but then, then, you know, we've got uh, a good mix of, of different heights uh, all around, all throughout, coming down the side. So it provides, in addition to the fence, a sort of a, a green buffer. Uh, certainly in the, in the front, there's a good amount of, of vegetation that will add to the aesthetics and provide for some buffering uh, at different heights. So you don't have that just, you know, you know low uniform shrub that, that sort of doesn't really distinguish or really do any good for anybody. I'll give you a minute to take a look at that. You have uh, four um, crab apples in the lower right corner of the site. Um, do you know how wide those, uh, the spread of those trees are as shown on the drawing? The reason I'm asking is that those crab apples have a very low crown. And if they're, they extend out into the sidewalk, it'll prevent people from walking past them. You won't be able to walk under them like you would uh, some shade trees. Yep. Okay. Uh, I, I do not happen to know that. I'm not sure if um, any of the other team does. But we're, but that's noted. Well, it looks to be about eight feet. Doesn't the, matter. Uh, tree? The mature spread of a, a sugar thyme crab is uh, 10 to 15 feet. And uh, they're not the kind of trees that would want to be pruned in order to be uh, kept that size. They, I mean, to, to keep them within the sidewalk, you may want to consider a different species in that in those four areas. Okay. The re rest of it, I think, is fine. It's a it's a good mix of uh, plant material, um, and uh, it, there's there's a nice density to it. I I do think Nelson, those crabs are in a bed that's slightly raised. Uh, if, as you remember that driveway sloping down and that's a small retaining wall it's not as big as the one on the property line side but right yes i think there is that a, would help it looked like at, there's it would, at, the, at the bottom it would help yes so is it, it, these are the ones you're talking about here yes yes, yes. right yeah right so this is this is sloped down so so i think your your comment probably would apply more to these two and not so yes much. that's correct and is there much sight lighting going to ha be happening? I see some bollard samples, but is there any other uh, expected exterior lighting? Is it going to be on the building? Jim, Ken? Uh, they'll, they'll, I'm sure there'll be some, um, but uh, I, um, I, I can't um, 
speak about that at the moment. Yeah, ge generally on the residential developments, it's you know it's limited to sort of just accent lighting. Yeah. Um, unlike commercial, where you've got you want to have you know big spotlights, illuminating parking lots and things like that. Well, it'd be helpful to have lighting on the the uh, ramp down of the parking, certainly uh, for <laughs> safety and security. Um, you're showing uh, permeable concrete pavers uh, near the uh, the front. Uh, are they required for the stormwater mitigation or uh, just to be environmentally cool? Uh, I do not believe that they are required. I think they're just to sort of, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to be putting them in, you might as well uh, be environmentally conscious and it goes green as, as you reasonably can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. We don't need we don't need those to to uh, meet any any stormwater or or drainage requirements. Okay. The only other question I had that wasn't clear to me is the uh, the railing construction. There's a fair amount of railing on the as a decorative element and as as an architectural feature on the both the front and back, and then there's a long ramp. Uh, what is the thought on what the railings could be made of? I imagined it to be uh, like a stainless steel, some sort of uh, clean, clean line and so a pipe rail or cable rail or uh, for the uh, handicap it would probably be a, a pipe rail. And the balconies. Um, that I imagined it to be uh, maybe the um, cable rail, but. Um, is as uh, thin as possible, I guess. Okay. Okay. Um, Mark? Yes. Yeah, quick, a couple of quick questions. Um, how tall is the fence between the two properties? I believe that's, a, that's six feet. Okay. Um, I think that's a good idea. Um, obviously, the first floor will be well above that from visual point of view, but it's still good, I think, on the proper, on the ground level. Um, is there any mature or semi-mature vegetation existing to remain? Uh, mm, no, there's, there's really not a lot of landscaping on site right now. Okay. It's that little office building in a parking lot for the most part, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was thinking more on the back line between the neighboring residential property. That's, um, it's paved to the edge, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's all this. This is all pavement on here. In fact, really, the only landscaping is, is like that little bit up in front. Well, then this will certainly be an improvement. Um, has anybody asked you about snow removal? No, not yet, but I expect that will be one of the things that uh, planning will serve. Okay, do. I'm asking about snow removal. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I mean, both, etc. It, we, um, you know, in a lot of the, the sort of the modern projects where we're doing things like underground parking and um, and sort of sort of more creative designs, uh, we we have to be more mindful of snow removal. So typically, it's basically you have to they have to anticipate having snow pulled out. You know, unlike in a traditional setting where you can maybe just plow it and bank it, yeah. uh, it's going to have to be you know sort of like these probably these five spaces. Will get lost uh, for a day or two in a significant snow event, and then the snow will have to get removed from here and taken out. Okay, I'm sure you're thinking about it. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's always an issue these days. Now, yeah, I, I didn't ask in the beginning. Are these rental units or condominiums? Condos. Okay. All right. Uh, any other? Questions, comments from the board? No, thanks for uh, all the answers, everybody. Yep, thank you. Oh, just one more about the garage door. Okay. Are, are these, is this controlled electronically by each tenant that opens and closes it as they go in and out? Or is that door left open? Anyone can drive in? Uh, closed electronically. Okay. Okay. Um, so I didn't, we had some different concerns other than the sort of the flowering crabs uh, in the lower right area of planting. I didn't 
feel anything significant that would be a condition we would want to impose unless that is uh, anything anyone wants to do? Uh, snow removal would affect landscaping. Uh, you can you can remove landscaping to create snow removal storage area or snow storage areas. Uh, I, as a landscape architect, I don't advise that, but uh, it's something to consider. Uh, it, was, it was my impression that they said they're going to, they understand that they're going to have it yeah. all, all the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and because of the, the elevation differences and whatnot, it would be really it would be difficult to affect to do that in a way that would work, I think, well as a practical matter. You know, really the area you'd have to do it would be in that back corner, but there's a great difference between where the landscaping is uh, on sort of the, the back backside and then where the pavement yeah. is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it doesn't really work. Anything else? Okay, well, nice, nice looking project, actually. Thank you. Uh, I would take a motion to approve the design as submitted. I so move. Second. I second. Okay, we come to the vote. Bob Dermody. I vote to approve. Nelson Hammer. Approve. Chad Riley. Approved. And Steve Tanner. Approved. And the chair approves. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. See you George. Thank you, guys. Right. Same here. Happy holidays. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. The next time on the agenda is uh, the minutes of November 16th, 2020. Any comments or changes or questions? Uh, I think they're fabulous. So thank you, Rana. Right, I take a motion to approve the minutes of November 16th, 2020. Second. Okay, come to the vote. Bob Dermody? Approve. Nelson Hammer? Approve. Chad Riley? Approve. Steve Tanner? Approved. And the chair approves. Um, I, I didn't mean not to respond, Bob. I just thought that I was like, wait a minute, the last time we met was November 16th, and then my brain started doing mental math. This year is just bleeding together at this <laughs> well, point. It has been quite a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have uh, seven from 31, what, 24 uh, days left? <laughs> yeah, Are there, is there anything else, uh, Elisa? Uh, just, um, just to let you know that uh, the high school has emailed me that they wanted to know when the next meeting is scheduled okay. and I, I um, okay I'll, I'll and I sort of took my time but I did get back to them it's on the 21st I don't know how all how you all feel about holding that meeting I have not heard from anyone else about applying to that meeting it's still early um they'd have to get their uh documents to me by the 13th I believe the Monday prior um so yeah, partly so, that's my fault. I don't know I, what you want me to say, but um, well, I've I've got some stuff started that I marked up, and then I stopped because I wanted to just chat with everyone. I remember at the last meeting I said I would mark up some of our concepts for them. I just want to make sure everybody's okay with that. I'm just going to do it, and yep. you'll have to live with whatever I tell them. But I was basically Steve suggested a whole new approach in the sign, which would be nice. But I think given that they're in a sort of funding cycle with these people that I'm gonna assume that it's gonna still be a big granite sign. We'll just try and get it uh, to look a lot better. So if the, just wanna make sure everyone's okay with that. I'm not gonna send them around because then we're gonna get in all sorts of trouble, but I will just kind of mark up some of the concepts that we talked about and get them back to them. I already kind of did it, but I didn't send it to them uh, thinking, I don't know why they're in such a hurry, but I think you must- And it seemed like they said they're ready. Like they have their drawings. No, they don't have anything. Okay. <laughs> Unless they change them. I mean, they. I know it. Uh, I I would, yeah. I I'll get the markups back to him this in the day or two, and then he can. At least, the, when is the next meeting after the twenty first, please? The eleventh of January. Okay. Oh, that's a good question. Do you want me to include the the table for the future meetings on the minutes? 
Are we are we zooming? Are we are we zooming? Yes, we are still zooming. Oh, we'll zooming. Get, All right. Even, yeah, until further notice, I would think. <laughs> uh, I'm out the eleventh, by the way. Okay. I just didn't know if you guys wanted. To, you know, there's really no rush for the high school. It's, it, but that's just my own pers personal opinion. And it's holiday season and not that we're all going to parties or anything, but it might be a nice break for you guys. Well, let's see where we are uh, next week. I mean, it's, we got to go through this week. If you get some interest, we'll, we'll hold the meeting. Um, yeah, I don't want to hold the meeting just for them because <laughs> exactly. it's, it's not like they go out there on January 5th and start digging post holes. So. The high school's not going out of business. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's some alumni pressure. Oh my! Okay, and uh, and Nelly, uh, can I just say that you know I'm sorry to see you in the neck brace, but it lends a lot more credence to your comments about safety. Yeah, it's uh, I'm I'm scared about that driveway. Uh, not only the steepness of it, but the turn into the garage is really tight. Yeah. Uh, cars are going to have to make a J turn. Uh, they're not going to be able to make it in one turn getting out, even if it's 24 feet wide, which it appears to be. Okay. I like the comment they made about heating that driveway. <laughs> I think it's almost essential, uh, an 8% slope uh, in, in this climate. Yeah, we'll see how they do. Uh, yeah, five spaces on the back, or their back bumpers are going to get dented. <laughs> yeah. You think? Yeah. yeah. If that's all good, that, that gets dented. All right. So I like I'll... that you guys don't hold back. Chad was basically like, buyers beware. If you buy into this property, then you're shit out of luck, basically, is what he said. <laughs> I don't think he said that. Well, so you got to be an exhibitionist to want to live in that thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I feel like um, you guys just don't hold back. <laughs> so I would take a motion to adjourn.